Yeah, thank you, Alex, very much. So it's really great to have this community together and to see see you all there and to at least uh, listen to what you what you are saying about your research work. And of course, the Schrödinger Institute. I've been there only only twice. is a very very special place, and definitely, as everybody has said so before, it would be great to get there together together in person again and enjoy the hospitality of, of Vienna and the great, great locations there. So what I'm presenting today is more or less a continuation of the Cormac conference, which was in August 2019, almost two years ago, where recent progress in tomography was, was discussed on a very broad sense, very much as similar to here. And I will more or less report in our conceptual experimental work on deep learning for CT and mention the few theoretical results, of course, which can be achieved in this context as well. But as you might expect from the title, uh, learning is still very, very much, needs much more math insight in order to uh, fully understand it as we would like to do it as scientists. But the experiments are interesting by, them, by themselves. So I will start with the motivation, which is rather broad and maybe boring for most of you before we come to the different deep learning concepts for inverse problems. And I will focus on the last two called the deep prior networks, which is related to learning with very few data, exactly with a single data point. And normalizing flows, which is sort of the opposite, where you try to learn the full distribution and not only get the, uh, the maximum a posterior your estimator or the mean estimator, but you can get the full distribution of potential solutions and can get variances as well. And the second part will then be about what we called the CT challenge, which has turned out to be more complex than expected to define a data set and a competition for comparing different deep learning approaches on a solid basis. Since as you all know, if you read those papers, whoever publishes a paper on deep learning for CT at the end has says, and we beat everything in the community, we have the best algorithm. And we want to find to get a good solid foundation for making a comparison, which tells really which algorithm is doing what. And at the end, I'll shortly remark about our future plans, how we would like to continue. Okay, so the motivation is, is as usual. So we are all brought, brought up in the cycle, cycle of modeling, simulation, and optimization, that whenever we tackle a technical problem, we try to build an abstract mathematical physics-based model in terms of an operator A, and in terms of inverse problems, we have, have given noisy data and we try to find an approximation to the physical X, which solves the equation AX equals Y. And in a sense of uh, noisy measurements, of course, we can only get approximations to that. So this classical approach is, is very successful. And once you have defined everything, typically you define some function spaces X and Y, and they are really crucial which ones you use. And then you get a perfect model and you can get optimal results in term, terms of reconstruction algorithms, conversions rates, discretization schemes, and so on. So within this mathematical framework, of course, it's clear what is optimal and there's nothing you, you can, can beat. But there are two points, two drawbacks, which are absolutely common for any of those model-driven approaches, which are hard to overcome. The one is the natural one that no model is ever complete. Even the CT model, which is pretty good, but of course the rays don't really travel on straight lines and the attenuation changes with the energy of the, of the X-ray and so forth. There are several, several aspects which are really neglected, which within the limits of the accuracy we are aiming for probably might not be so valuable, but it's absolutely obvious that no model is, is ever complete. And there are always some physical details which might be needed to be added for getting a better, better reconstruction. But actually, this is not the point which, which is the best entry point for talking about data-driven approaches. It's more important to talk about the set of useful inputs. So at least when we go to discretization or let's say the, the function space X where we search for the reconstruction is the L2 over some domain, then it's clear that not every L2 function or in the discretized form, not every matrix is really a CT image. 
is it every CT image is an L2 function or a matrix in this device form, but not vice versa. So how can you define and characterize the set of meaningful, the domain of the operator A, so that it's meaningful for, for, certain, for certain tasks? And there have been tremendous efforts in characterizing natural images in terms of decay of the Fourier coefficients. Yves Mayer said it's the divergence of an H3 over two vector field, but nothing of them really allows you to characterize natural images good enough. And even if it does give you a good characterization, then you would like to distinguish between a landscape image and a CT image or between a CT image with a tumor and a CT image without a, without a tumor. So you, you can refine this question arbitrarily. And it's, I think it's clear that there's no good mathematical formulation for natural images in the sense of those complex applications we have in mind. So the question is how to include specific information about this domain of definition or how to get it in the first place. And I think it is rather obvious that if you have sufficiently many data sets, X and Y, where you know what are the natural images X you're looking for and you know what are the data Y for it, then you can answer all those questions. Even the smallest operator details, mapping details are contained in a sufficiently large data set. And of course, the characterization of meaningful data, this domain of definition DA is absolutely contained if you have meaningful, a good enough data set for, the, for your problem. So this is then the basis for starting to think about data-driven approaches. And there are different classes, if you like to say so. And the, the lazy kind of data-driven approaches are you take the best analytic, the best reconstruction method you can find in the literature, do the best what is on the market, state of the art, and then just do some post-processing, exploiting this prior distribution of the natural images. So by this way, you cannot be worse than the best algorithm available since you built on it, and unless your algorithm does something wrong, it can in the best case do nothing and still be as good as the best state of the art algorithm. So this is a sure way of improving results using a data-driven approach. And you should keep in mind, you also use more information since those test data, X and Y are available and they are information you don't have available in your classical inverse problems reconstruction scheme. And the second approach is obviously the one that you somehow exploit this prior distribution, you learn it and, and exploit it. So we will come back to this, this later. Don't be upset by this uh, counting of the, of the pages. We can stop after page 30. This would be a natural, natural ending, people see. So just to, just to uh, get this point home, no model is perfect and not every matrix is an image. Those are the key, key properties we want to have. And just to illustrate this, if this plane is the X space, let's say space of matrices or L2 functions, then what we typically have in terms of inverse problems is this orange set. We look at this set of potential solutions, all axes such that AX minus Y delta explains the data within the, the noise level. And we know this is this long shaped, uh, this ill poseness of the problem has this instability that this set is in certain dimensions corresponding to the small eigenvalues for linear operators is getting infinite and unbounded. And on a second, second from the other side, from the data terms point of sight, you have this very irregular set of meaningful images. Say so you have this blue set, which is the set of CT images, which are somehow embedded. Some people call this the data manifold, but it's by no means clear whether this should have a manifold structure. So it's just a set of meaningful images which are somehow embedded and which is much diff more difficult to characterize. And of course, there are plenty of approaches and experimentally as well as theoretical first steps trying to exploit this. And to make absolutely clear what is the difference. So if you talk about the least square solutions in a sense, we all have learned for solving inverse problems you would choose the upper green dot as the best reconstruction. 
This is the one which explains the data in, in its limits and has minimal norm. So this would be the ticket of minimizer with an XL2 penalty term. And if you have the information about the distribution, you would say, oh no, I would take the one with minimal norm, which explains the data and has a high probability in terms of this prior distribution. So we would definitely have something like a projection on this set D of A. And I guess Markus Haltmeier is the, the leading expert for this type of methods with this net approach and, and the second approach he's, he's propagating. So there are different ways of, of exploiting this, but this is the picture we should have in mind that there is some unknown set which we try to learn from data and somehow exploit it mathematically. So the somehow ex to exploit the somehow, we want to use neural nets and neural networks are a concept, an algorithm, a mathematical formulation, formalism, which is motivated by the neural system and the way information is processed in the neural system. So in the top middle, this is the first graphical description of a neural system of red, 1897 by a French scientist. He extracted and prepared those this network from from a, from a red. And we have to understand there are some sensors where the information is gathered, where they are input in the system. So you touch something and your sensors start to send information from the fingertips to your brain. And it goes along those uh, neural paths and at neurons they are processed. So a neuron can be a rather complex biochemical chemical reaction. But the common feature we try to exploit is that there are several ways of entering information and then this information is processed and a reaction from the neuron is produced. And this is rebuilt by, by the neural networks in the sense we will formalize on the next slide. But first I would like to remark that the, the human brain has about 80 billion neurons. That's an enormous amount of complexity which is existing in our brain. Five million kilometers of, of pathways are in our brain. And for a long time, the, uh, the artificial neural networks were still a bit smaller, but now GPT-3, which has been just announced, I think earlier this year in January, has 170 billion neurons and is still being managed, it's still manageable to be trained. So the complexity of the, of the neural networks has approximately reached the complexity of the human brain. And it is still only focused on specific tasks. So it's not like our brain has to split its, its power between thousands of different tasks. They are optimized for certain tasks like character recognition, speech recognition, street sign recognition. And it's, I think, pretty cl clear that for those specific tasks, they have a capacity which we should not neglect. It's really great. Okay, so just, just once more, this is the, uh, the setup how, uh, how what's happening in a neuron in a mathematical fashion. You enter certain signals, X0 to X2, along the neural passes, they are either even amplified or reduced. So they are weighted with some wake factors. Then the sum of those signals enters the uh, neuron and there it is processed by a nonlinear so-called activation function and a single value is put out. So this is now the formal description and there are different ways of looking at that. The best is probably to look at the graph at the bottom. So just two numbers enter. They are multiplied with, with certain values. They are combined in the middle neurons. Then some nonlinear activation function phi kicks in, changes this. The outgoing weights are fixed here and then you get some sort of result. And you can write this as, a, as an iteration scheme, like in the top, or you can write it as a functional approximation scheme with a certain parameterization by W and B, or as a flowchart. And of course, there are much more complex networks. So this is a fully connected network with three hidden layers, or this is probably the most widely used one in image processing, the UNET by the Freiburg mathematician Ronneberger and co-workers, and this has been cited within a short time, several 10,000 times. This unit architecture is now a completely different description. The way to describe it by those graphic elements is a very powerful one, which also lends to mathematical investigation. 
And I just want to say, of course, what I will present and most people do are concepts and experimental results. There is the beginning of a mathematical theory developing. And I would say from our point of view, probably Andrew Stewart's results over the last two or three years on the statistical evaluation of neural networks for parameterized PDEs is probably the best, I, at least for my taste, is the best work I've seen so far. Good. Okay, now let's talk about neural networks for inverse problems. And first, let's make clear why this is a complex task and more complex like computer vision where deep learning has its greatest, greatest successes. In computer vision, I think for sweet sign detection, speech detection, uh, and objects recognition, neural networks are perfect and well-trained. Classification with images is, is absolutely great. But let's talk about a very small two by two inverse problem first. So we have this matrix, which we all know is ill post depending on the value of epsilon. The more ill post, the smaller epsilon gets. And we create a network which allows us to mimic multiplication by a two by two matrix. So we have just two inputs. We use this rectified linear unit, which is the means negative values are neglected, positive pass. And we make sure that no matter whether the first entry of the matrix vector multiplication is positive or negative, it either passes in the first neuron of the hidden layer or in the second one, and then we correct the sign in the last one. And the output of this network is exactly the matrix vector product of the two inputs by the matrix, by a two by two matrix. And of course, now we take the opposite approach. We just take draining data. We take lots of sets, xi and yi, and we try to learn those weights in the network, those coefficients, W1 up to W8 in the small network, either for the forward problem, where we say we train the loss function such that it maps Xi to Yi, or for the inverse problem. And we do the standard setting of generating data and adding some, some noise to it. Okay, in the first case, the loss function is just the output of the networks where you feed in the x1, the xi's, and you compare it with the output, and you have 10,000 realizations of the draining data and drain it. Then you fix the network and you generate some new data, and by for sure you can prove what the network does. It gets the matrix out, and the more data you have, the smaller is the variance you expect for that. However, if you do this for the inverse problem, what you get out is in expectation is the, uh, the Tukhanov matrix, perfect, the best one we can think of, where the uh, regularization factor is the noise level. However, the variance can be arbitrarily big. So this shows that for inverse problems, it's much harder. So whenever somebody says, I can give you a million data points, I can give him a matrix, and can tell them with probability, probability 99%, your reconstruction matrix will be off by a factor of 10. And this is clearly indicated by this, by this matrix. When epsilon and sigma are, in the, uh, are on the same level, this is the worst case situation you can have. No matter how many training data sets you have, your results will be bad. So the noise, the mean squared error is, is absolutely large. So this is, shows that you cannot just take a matrix off the shelf for, for, for inverse problems. They have their problems of their own. So let me shortly sketch the four dominant approaches for, for learned approaches to inverse problems. Post-processing, as I've already explained, you take the best analytic algorithm, which takes you already back in the, in the image domain X. And then you just project onto your set of meaningful full data, DA, by some method which where you use the learned, learned distribution. And in the second part, I will show you one approach for doing this. The second one is that you just learn the prior distribution. So for the learning, you don't know the image data, you don't know the Ys, you only know the Xs. And then you take the negative log likelihood as a penalty term in the classical Tikhonov scheme. Then this actually is the, the map estimator in the statistical sense if your noise model is, is uh, the Gaussian independent identically distributed noise. So this is the second approach, which is sort of standard. You learn the, uh, learn the uh, 
learn the distribution of the data and use the negative log likelihood as a, as a penalty term for mapping your reconstruction to the linkage to the data. Of course, you can use it for learning operator updates. That's, for example, what Simon's group has been doing for optoacoustic tomography and, and other applications. You can learn the parts of your, of your physical model which are not, not yet well modeled or which you don't want to have in your model in order to speed up the reconstruction scheme. And you can leave the finer parts of the model to a learned approach, which always leads to quick reconstructions. And of course, the main part is, the, uh, is the, uh, to learn a full inversion. Namely, you just input the data and you will somehow get out, the, get, get out the reconstruction. And there, the best part, I think the most widely used one are so-called on-road iterations. And the easiest way to explain this is using this ISTA scheme. When you say you have this proximal mapping approach iteration for uh, minimizing a tuchinal functional, then you do an iteration where you always take a gradient step with respect to the discrepancy term, this AX minus Y delta in some norm. And then you take care of the penalty term by the proximal mapping related to, to R. So this iteration is probably widely used and has been used for breakdown iterations and, and, and other, other more general penalty terms and is widely used and very successful. So if you look at that from the point of deep learning, it's exactly the architecture of a network. Since you have some affine linear transformation of the iterates. So if you now think of the iterates of being transporting the information from layer to layer, every iteration corresponds to one internal layer. Then from one layer to the next, you perform an affine linear transformation and a point-wise nonlinearity. So if you know the theory about regularization, of inverse problems, it's clear that you have, it's good to use a network which is fully connected, which is restricted to reproducing matrix vector multiplication and uses the proximal mapping as activation function. This was exactly this fundamental paper by Gregor and Jan Lan Lequin, 2010, where they had a fully connected network, just 10 layers, and they tried to optimize for speeding up the reconstruction scheme the, uh, this type of approach. And then you just train the network by choosing those matrix W or the weights of your, of your network by first applying the edge joint to your data, which brings it back to the, to the image, proper image per meter domain. And then you just try to match it to the ground truth data you assume you're having. So in this sense, this scheme is, is doing the following. If you now not fix your matrix W to be I minus lambda A star A with a true operator, but then you keep this as the, as the weights of your network free and open for optimization, then it's a nice way of viewing this list algorithm as optimizing the Tikhonov functional. So actually when you use this fully connected with the restriction to this type of matrices, type of network, then optimizing the weights, W or B, they are related by this simple relation, is the same as saying that you do a fixed number of gradient descent steps for a token of functional with the matrix B and the corresponding penalty term. So that's what we, what we phrased called the analytic list star, since we assume that the network is deep enough so that this actually converges. So in our sense, list star is optimizing the functional to be minimized with respect to the data, and then outputs the minimize of such a particular functional. So Lister, the analytic Lister is minimizing, is constructing a good B and then outputting the minimize of that. Okay. And if you do this for, for our small problem or similar 10 by 10 type problem of this kind, we're pretty much disappointed that Lister is not better than Ista. And this took us a while to understand why everybody says deep learning is better, but it's not better if your data covers the full space. And our sampling of the data Y and X was covering the full space. And then the mathematical optimization criterion cannot be beaten. And of course, the ISTA algorithm is optimal. It cannot be beaten. 
But if we go to the case that we have a DA, a domain of definition, which is restricted, say to a two or three dimensional subdomain, in this case, just a linear subdomain, then Vista is better. Since then, we somehow learn the, uh, the structure of the data and exploit it, while the classical Tikhonov time scheme has no idea about the special data and just uses the multipurpose reconstruction scheme. Okay, so only when you take into account this specific structure of the data, then you have a chance that learned algorithms will beat your classical approaches. Okay, now let's go to the, to the case of learning with few data. And I think this is the only slide which requires some, some thinking for, for digesting a potentially new concept. Since this work by Ulyanov and Lempitsky really changed the point of view how they regard neural networks. And they were training a network without data. So they only use the Y delta, the, da the data set and the operator A. They only use the same type of information as we are having in the classical inverse problem setting. And they say, we take a network which has been predefined. They take a unit, a pretty off the shelf standard multipurpose network. They fix the input to the network. They just choose an arbitrary set. And then they make gradient descent of the functional given here, where they change the weights of the, of the network. And for the same input set, of course, they get different outputs depending on the W. So they parameterize this manifold of D of A by changing the weights of the network. So this is contrary to the previous approaches where you try to train and fix W and then traverse this manif data manifold by changing the input set. They said, let's keep set fixed and traverse this manifold by changing the Ws. And the way you try to adapt this to a data set is just by creating descent. So really amazing that this should work without any training, but here's an example. So this is the ground truth data from the Mayo Clinic, one of those standard data sets. And if you read, this is a ground truth data reconstructed with full data set. And if you take out 75% of the, of the projections, then a fiddle back projection still gives a good reconstruction peak as an R25.21. If you start with a random image, of course, you get a very poor peak as an R, and then you start this iteration. And after a few iterations, you are getting quite a bit better than the fiddle back projection algorithm. So how can that be? So the idea of course is you have to have a stopping rule. If you start to iterate further and further, you would have kicking in this inverse problems approach that you finally would diverge from the true solution. But if you stop correctly, you get a much better reconstruction and the back projection. So how can that be? And in the general case of a general architecture, we cannot analyze this, but if you take the Lista architecture, fully connected L-identical layers, and the architecture in such a sense that you only allow matrices, weight matrices, which have the structure identity minus, minus lambda P squared B, then this analytic P prior network corresponds to a bi-level optimization where you minimize with respect to W the uh, discrepancy, discrepancy term, and your phi w set is the minimizer of a Tikhonov functional, which is changing depending on the, on the learning. And that's what we call the analytic deep prior is the solution of this by level optimization problem. And for that, we can actually prove everything. And we can use a nice characterization of what's happening in the network. And we can show what happens in the easiest case of a linear operator that is corresponds to a filter function, which is somehow between Tikhonov and uh, truncated singular value decompositions. And it's an optimal regularization scheme. And we can also do some numerical examples using the integration operator where we can, can see what happens. So we take ground truth data, which coincides with one of the singular values. 
to see how the ill process kicks in. And then we see the optimized matrix B really has the structure of a projection of a projection onto this singular function. And of course, the, the error was general, so you have to keep part of the, uh, of the channel operator in the background as well. And you can beat the, uh, the results experimentally with many data sets. And if you also learn alpha, which is um, then an easy step, you get a much, much better result. And this is consistent with the theory, and we can prove that this is definitely better than using if taken off with an optimized but fixed out. Okay, so this was one approach where we can learn with a single data point as much as we have for the classical inverse problems and still improve. And I would like to also give, allow you to uh, show you a few results about learning this distribution. And there we had a great uh, PhD student who's a postdoc who went to Toronto and is now working for Apple. Unfortunately, he introduced the concept of normalizing flows to us. And there's the idea that you have, if you have thousands of images which give you a good, good impression about the distribution of the axis, but only picture to picture, not in a formalized sense. The normalizing flows are by Resende five years ago introduced, Resende and his co-workers. And the idea is to train a network. So this is, has as an output something which is normally distributed. First, you have to know whenever you have a diffeomorphism, then it's clear how distributions also change under this diffeomorphism. So if this is an invertible differentiable network, then the distribution of set and the distribution of axis has a fixed relation. So now the idea is to drain the network such that the output is a known and easy accessible distribution, say Gaussian distribution, zero one distributed, pixel by pixel, zero one distributed. And then you can assume you have an invertible network, also sample the distribution of axis by sampling this normal distribution of set and going backwards through your network. So this is a strategic way, a concept of really traversing and characterizing this data manifold, which you then can also exploit for not only getting a reconstruction, but you can get a variance on the reconstruction and you can get different reconstruction schemes as well. We come to that in a, in a minute. So how do you train such a network? So there you need a measure for how close those two, uh, two distributions are. And we can, you can take the kullback leiter divergence or um, empirical version using the data set. And you train the network very much in the classical scheme for, for training networks by gradient descent. But you need to have some efficient way of getting those derivatives, the Jacobians, which is typically employing some fixed point iteration for say, in virtual resonance, or it's pretty easy if you take this coupling layer idea or other type of, of uh, easy invertible networks. So it needs an invertible network, but then you can really characterize the, the data manifold pretty easily. So and this allows you for given data Y, not only to reconstruct an X, but to get the full conditional distribution, which is called a posterior distribution of X given Y and you use the Bayes theorem. And since we now have the prior distribution of X available, since we can sample from that, we can do everything with it. The first one is just the data error model for X given Y, which Y are likely, you take A of X and you assume normal distributed noise. And then the map estimator is exactly this minimizer of this signal functional with negative log likelihood. But you can also look for the mean reconstruction and you can look for the variances. And we use a slightly more complex version where we uh, condition the network with the best reconstruction we have, namely the filter back projection reconstruction. So we have some idea where this network should be going and then we get an even better, better scheme. And this is a typical type of results you are getting. So you can not only get the, uh, get the, uh, the conditioned mean reconstruction, but you also get information where the model is sure that it's that it has the right values. And of course, where the where the edges are, it's clearly in this case that this the variance is large. This variance image doesn't make too much sense for CT reconstructions, but for technical reconstructions, it makes a lot of sense 
since they are the uh, engineers get a clear impression of where their process is highly volatile or prone to produce errors. Okay, now come to the last part of the talk, the five, last five, five minutes. So this was about four or five years ago. I was sitting together with Simon Erich and, and Karola Schönleib, and we said every community has its standardized data sets for letter recognition, for street sign recognition, MNIST, even for, for fashion images, their standardized data sets. There's none for CT. And I said, I have two excellent new PhD students, Maximilian Schmidt and Johannes Leuchner, are four weeks and they should produce a data set, which is standardized. But it took them about a year. And first of all, there are so many different challenges in CT, you have to focus on one. Otherwise, it's not meaning to create a data set. So we focused on low dose. So full number of angles, full number of detectors, but a bad measurement statistics as a first data set. So the low dose parallel beam data set. And they used available data sets from the Mayo Clinic and from this LIDC data sets, the E3 database to extract 40,000 images in standardized form. Standardized means you have to standardize um, the, uh, the size of the images. You have to throw out completely rubbish results where the ground truth is not really available. And then you use the high quality reconstructions as ground truth and you simulate the low quality, low dose data for those 40,000 images in a standardized form and with enough variance into it. And there are lots of details which are worthwhile discussing how you do the simulation in a, in a sense that you, that even applied people are happy. So there are plenty of discussions with medical people, people from the applied community. And now this has been fixed. And actually this led to a publication in Nature. Nature has a sub journal called Nature Scientific Data. And uh, those two students without any problems got their data set accepted in this, in, um, in Nature. Okay, this is no nature, it will be published this year, has been accepted last year. And this is within a very short time, the most highly downloaded paper on archive we have ever written. Which is a bit of shame since it has no math in it, just math motivated simulation of a good data set for our community. And then we created a challenge. So this was Maureen van Eidnaten from, from Amsterdam. She organized it. And we said we invite all the communities who have some deep learning software for CT reconstructions to join a competition on the standardized data set. They have a four, fair comparison. And the comparison is in terms of quality, but also maybe in runtime, maybe in the number of data and hardware requirements. So you have plenty of, of um, evaluation schemes. But the two major ones, and I think I jumped directly to the results for the, uh, for the Ludopub data set for the real data, is in terms of quality, which we measure in either peak as an R or structural similarity index, SSIM. But the results are really equivalent for the, those two measures. And also in terms of the data size we use for the training. So in, in order to understand those images, we take the filter back projection reconstruction with optimized parameters, which of course is independent of the, uh, of the training size of training data. It doesn't use any training data. So if you use filter back projection and TV post-processing, we get better in both measures. And that's what we call this now the, the baseline we have to beat with, with learned approaches. And then we use this deep prior approach, which also doesn't use any data. So the quality of the, uh, of the reconstructions does not change with the data size being used. And it's by far better and consistently better with this real data we, we have been using therefore. And then we checked how long does it take for the real deep learning approaches using multiple data sets to beat this. And 0.01% of the data size corresponds to using four data sets. So this is not sufficient, but when you start having 40 to 50 data sets of this kind, then this unrolled primal dual algorithm of Adler and Ökten already starts to beat. And it's really significantly beats, beats all other approaches when you have sufficiently many data. The one learned approach in green here is just taking 
no information from the math side, just inputting Y, outputting X, not using any unrolled iteration scheme, no math. So this corresponds to the approach of the two by two matrix I was presenting at the, at the first, first part. And as you can see, even with lots of data, it's not really competitive, which is fun to see. And the mathematically motivated deep learning approaches did much, much better. Okay, so this is now the leaderboard from this from this challenge result from this code sprint. Primal Dual is the winner. Learn Primal Dual, Dual is the best. This is the unit who was a Chinese student of Ivan Dogmanich in Basel who provided a very good idea. Using many, of course, plenty of data. If you use only a single data set, this deep image prior plus TV post-processing is, is the best one. And one can really, I'm sorry to say, even I'm a mathematician, I'm convinced that those learned approaches are for this type of application, beating the analytic approaches of field effect projection and post-processing whatever you have on, in your, on your shelf. Okay, that's it, what I want to tell you for the moment. So it's fascinating to do experiments, fascinating to do experiments. Theory is evolving, but we need novel concepts, mathematical concepts to really understand what is going on. And I think this is an exciting topic for mathematicians for the next for the next decade. Thank you, Alex.